What I mean when I say crystal structure is that the atoms are arranged very orderly. <clears throat> this is an example. This is a uh, crystal of, of halite, which is table salt. And it's composed of sodium ions and chlorine ions arranged in a very three-dimensional matrix so that the small sodiums are actually fitting in the cracks between the chlorines. And you'll see that it could go on forever. You could have an enormous piece of salt. You could have a piece of salt as big as a building or as big as a town, really. The whole mine could be one piece of salt, and then you, you would break it into smaller, smaller pieces because it just keeps arranging itself in that same orderly configuration. Now, I said before that minerals have a definite chemical composition, so there's a recipe for it, like NaCl for table salt. But in the real world, you're going to see that there um, can be impurities to minerals. So, for instance, a little bit of, an, of a different ion slip in instead of the sodium, and for the most part you have sodium, but you might have a stain of, say, potassium or calcium or something like that embedded inside the salt. It would still be considered a mineral. Uh, so, though that it's a definite composition, you could have impurities, and the impurities are what makes all the different colors. If you can think of, say, precious stones, like a big basket of gemstones, all valuable, some of them thousands and thousands of dollars, um, what, what's making them so pretty? What are giving them all the different colors? Sometimes you're going to see that it's an impurity, it's a stain inside the, the mineral composition, but that doesn't keep it from being a mineral. Even though it's not 100% exactly every single atom in that uh, sample the same, for the most part you can have a definite uh, chemical composition or recipe with some substitutions. So let's test ourselves. Are the following materials considered a mineral or not? Okay, so let's look at them one at a time. Ice. Well, let's go through them. Is it naturally occurring? So if it's the ice in your freezer, it would not be considered a mineral because that's not naturally occurring. You made that happen. You have a little laboratory in your kitchen and you froze that water. But if this were in an in a ice bank or a glacier or something like that, uh, ice suspended floating in the water, then it would be. It has a definite composition, H2O. It has a very specific, regular uh, structure, crystal structure. Now, water doesn't. Now, that's interesting. It's the same stuff, but as a liquid, it doesn't have a chemical uh, a crystal structure, but as a solid, it would. So ice as water, frozen water, as long as it's naturally occurring, would be considered a mineral. Cubic zirconia is what you think of as a, like the FACO diamond ring. It looks uh, like a diamond, but it costs four bucks. So cubic zirconia is really just um, zirconium, which is a, an element, um, and oxygen. So it's a zirconium oxide. And the only way that a crystal will form is when you take that to a tremendous temperature in the laboratory. And if you do it and then you cool it down in a very certain way, you can get what you can sell as uh, knockoff diamonds, and it would even fool some people. But um, since that doesn't occur naturally, you're not going to have crystals of zirconium oxide in nature. So therefore, since it's a th synthetic material, it's not a mineral, even though it looks like a mineral. How about chocolate? OK, chocolate has a chemical formula. Um, I'll write down. Uh, the chemical formula of chocolate in case anybody's interested. Okay, this is actually the uh, the bitter quality of chocolate. Um, so you've got, uh, it's actually called theobromine, which is strange since there's no bromine in it, but it's this is the alkaloid or the bitter substance in chocolate, and it's carbon-based. And because it's carbon-based, even though it's naturally occurring, okay, even though that it is has a structure, has a chemical structure, a very specific structure, there's a shape of it, uh, it's got carbon, so it's not inorganic, so chocolate cannot be. How about a gold nugget? If I suggest a nugget, then I'm just by that word making you think that this is something I dug out of the ground. It was a it was a 
piece of gold that had leached into a rock and basically suspended in the rock and you can see a, a seam of gold through a, say a quartz or some other kind of rock. As a nugget, um, that would be considered uh, a mineral because it matches all of the other criterion and it's naturally occurring. Uh, if you melt down that gold and now it's a bar of gold, it's no longer considered a mineral. Glass, we already mentioned, it's amorphous, meaning there's no specific uh, definite shape to its crystal, so therefore it would not be. But salt was also one we looked at, that's the halite crystal, which has a very definite composition. It has a specific structure, it's naturally occurring, there's no carbon in it, so salt would certainly be a mineral. And it's dug like a mineral, it's mined. You have salt mines just like you have silver mines. Once we have the idea that we have all these minerals, now we have a building blocks for rocks. So rocks are an aggregate or a co collection of these different minerals. Sometimes you can have a rock with one kind of mineral in it. Um, and that would still be considered a rock if you had a huge piece of this or that. You could call it a rock because of course it looks like a rock, but it would be one type of a mineral. Uh, or it could be made up of a bunch of different minerals. Okay, so you could have like a granite countertop in your kitchen made up of um, the different specific uh, types of minerals that you could look at and point your finger to and say, oh, this one is different from this one. It has a different shape, it has a different shininess, okay? And then just because rocks look like rocks, there can be some rocks that are not made up of minerals. So a rock of coal, even though it's not carbon, is still considered a, a rock, it look, looks like a stone. And if you had a piece of obsidian, which is that black volcanic glass, um, it's amorphous, so it doesn't have a crystal structure, but you would still think of it as a rock. But rocks primarily you wanna think of as composed of minerals, each of which have these criterion we looked at. So here's an example of the granite that I was talking about. Granite has been melted in a volcano. And so each of these minerals would have melted and together and then just kind of hardened together. So in this case, this example, you've got some black and white and uh, tan colors in this piece of granite. And these are represented by these minerals that you see at the bottom, feldspar and hornblende and quartz. The quartz is the glassy, uh, shimmery type uh, of stuff inside the granite. And then the, the dark would be the hornblende and the feldspar is the brown. So um, in this case, three specific minerals, but when you have a piece of quartz, you don't think of, I have hornblende or I have feldspar. Quartz is the rock that you're talking about that happens to be made up of these smaller um, minerals. So as a final review, you have atoms that make up these minerals and minerals that make up these rocks. And then you have rock layers, so multiple, uh, multiple rocks that would make up, say, a hillside. So as we look at the structure of things, uh, often we have to go all the way down to the tiniest of, uh, of scales in order to see what we're really looking at so that we can then estimate things like strengths or whether something's reactive or, or uh, all kinds of things that we would have as we uh, question the world around us.